She's teaching a course this semester a little bit different from my course. It's called Reporting in Latin America. But considering the time differences, our classes meet at the, the, uh, the same hour. And so we're Skyping sessions back and forth between universities. And our spring breaks are the same period of time. And I take my class to Mexico City every spring break Hello. and uh, uh, for several days. And so both classes are going to Mexico City over spring break. We'll go have a lot of sessions at Tech de Monterrey, the main Mexico City campus of that university, and also two other campuses of that university. Do you know Tech de Monterrey? I mean, so it's a campus, a uh, 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 countrywide private university, very prestigious in Mexico, more than 30 campuses. And three are in the Mexico City area. We have one day of sessions at each campus there. And we uh, will also visit newspapers and uh, TV operations and so on. So it's a wonderful opportunity for the students to learn something and also to drink tequila and, and uh, mix with uh, the tech students and so on. So it works out fine. Anyway, Celeste is here all this week, and she leaves tomorrow afternoon, and so she consented to, to do this session, for which we're grateful. This is her latest book, Muy Buenas Noches, Mexico, Television, and the Cold War. This is about uh, Televisa, the, the huge TV operation in Mexico. It's like an octopus. It, it's just, it covers everything there. And I'll pass that around. And this is another book, Arizona Firestorm. And this is what you're talking about mm -hmm. now. This is about immigration, global immigration realities, national media, and provincial politics. So I'll pass that around as well. She's working on a book now with a colleague about journalistic coverage of the drug war along the border on the Mexican side, newspapers and broadcasting stations a little bit in, into Mexico where the violence has been so bad. Before she became, uh, in, uh, before she entered the uh, academic realm, she was a professional TV journalist for 16 years. Lots of experience. So welcome, it's, the lo uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, my colleague Lucila Vargas for inviting me and helping to organize this talk. Um, Tree for, you know, helping to organize this, and um, the, the UNC Journalism and Mass Communications School. Um, as, as Dr. Cole said, I'm going to be talking about immigration and the media and politics, and uh, one of my sort of long-standing interests aside from looking at journalism in Mexico and the media in Mexico has been just ha the media's role in shaping uh, our perceptions, our understanding, and sometimes misunderstanding uh, about uh, immigration, particularly in, in Arizona, in the Arizona-Sonora borderlands where I've where I've worked and where I've conducted um, some of my research. So I, I just wanted, before I do some of the formal part of the, of the talk, I wanted to show you, uh, just to show that, you know, immigration, as uh, probably everybody here knows, uh, is a very uh, timely topic, has been, and will continue to be for probably, you know, decades to come. And I don't foresee that we're going to be able to solve, solve things, even with, uh, with the maybe comprehensive immigration reform plan, but maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is an international uh, magazine. I just picked this up about 15 minutes ago at the, the student union called The Week. And then it has a photo, uh, an image of this beautiful family here um, on its way to the Statue of Liberty, the American dream of you know, I was, I was telling Dr. Cole, this kind of looks to me like Dorothy and the Scarecrow in the, on their way to the, following the yellow brick road to the Emerald City. That's sort of the metaphor that was, I don't know if that's what the artist w was intending, but that's kind of the image that I, bringing them out of the shadows according to that, um, that headline there in that magazine. Just, you might be familiar with some of these, these statistics already, but just to kind of situate us and put us immigration to a little bit of context here, what is happening here in uh, North Carolina, you've, you actually have um, 
in terms of states with the largest undocumented residents uh, is, this was according to 2011 statistics, about 400,000 undocumented people. Uh, and about, according to this, uh, which was the statistics by the Center of Innovative Media at George Washington University, Arizona actually has a, a few less, well, about 40,000 less, 360. Um, 360,000 undocumented residents. So, um, and North Carolina has one of the largest increases in undocumented people, about 50% increase over the first decade or so of the 21st century. So I'll pass that around to you in case you wanna look more closely at those statistics. Um, you know, this immigration is a serious topic and sometimes it, it takes a comedian to kind of drive some of the, the points home. Uh, it's, I thought this might be an interesting way to, talk, to uh, begin today, just to, to see what uh, the Colbert Report is reporting in, you know, in quotes, uh, after the uh, bipartisan uh, group from the Senate launched its, or unveiled its uh, latest plan last, week or so ago. I won't play the whole thing because it's like six, six minutes, but I'll, I'll play some of it for you. Hispanics, you know, they're tight family. They have, uh, you know, they're religious, Catholic. They're socially conservative. This ought to be our vote. They are socially, economically conservative, patriotic, church-going, family-oriented people who are very entrepreneurial, and they ought to be part of our coalition. Yes, Hispanics and Republicans go together like beans and very, very white rice. <laughs> that is highly suspicious of the beans. <laughs> All right, uh, if you want to, I heard some people laughing, some people, you know, probably maybe didn't find some of this very funny. Um, Otto Santana, who helped to co-edit the book, uh, Arizona Firestorm with me, has done some really interesting work on humor and uh, stereotypes and, and why maybe, you know, some of these jokes, uh, you know, have a, have a lot of other meanings there. But embroiled, I think, in, in that short clip are a lot of these issues related to the, um, the media and, and what we think about immigration. That's why I wanted to show you that. And I wanted to see if anybody, you know, keep you, keep you guys awake too, so hopefully that helps. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the book cover. In case anybody's wondering, the uh, Alto Arizona, that means stop Arizona. Uh, it has the uh, exclamation point you see there. This is um, artwork actually by um, Karen Grajeda, 
who was uh, an activist artist who contributed to this campaign called the Alto Arizona uh, art campaign. Um, and she created this, this graphic here. Which, and uh, we asked her if she would uh, be willing to let us use that image uh, and give her credit. And so um, she, was, she was willing to let us do that. The other part of the image there is Vito SB 1070. So everybody, uh, that's the infamous show me your papers law that I'll be talking about that was passed in, in Arizona in 2010. So today um, I'd like to sort of give you a background about the sort of context, the political and economic context, some of the cultural context that it was in existence at the time of the passage of SB 1070. Talk about some of the fallout that has resulted since its passage. Uh, we don't talk about that in the book. Uh, the book came out uh, over the summer, so we didn't have time to, to include that. Um, just, I'll give you an overview of, of the book itself in case you're interested. And the, uh, my, I'm a historian by training, so I want to explain what, um, some, some of my research and uh, talk about the connections between history and the media and our perceptions about undocumented people. And uh, more specifically about some of the results in, that are published in the book with respect to media roles in terms of uh, US elite media, mainly newspapers, uh, with respect to Spanish language media, mainly television in the United States, and media in Mexico, and how those di distinct uh, media portrayed immigration uh, at the time that SB 1070 was passed. And then maybe, hopefully, I'll have time to maybe talk a little bit about prospects for the future. And, Hopefully, that'll be more of a, a group discussion. Oh, by the way, uh, anybody recognize that? Um, that's Jan Brewer, known by some activists as Jan Bruja uh, in, in Arizona, the woman who signed uh, SB 1070 into law. Bruja means witch in Spanish, so Jan Bruja. Uh, Demographic changes were occurring in 2010 at the point of this uh, signing of SB 1070. The population in Arizona was about 6.4 million, with most people concentrated in the Phoenix area, Maricopa County, the county that uh, maybe you've heard about with uh, the infamous hardline sheriff, Joe Arpaio, uh, and then the other big sort of metropolitan areas, Tucson, where the University of Arizona is located, about a, an hour's drive from the, t uh, from the border. Um, the U.S.-Mexico border. So between 2010-2010, there was a 24 percent or almost 25 percent increase in Arizona's population, much of it immigrants, uh, much of them migrants from other parts of the, the country. So a lot of Californians, people from Chicago, nice weather, except, you know, from Jan July to September is a little tough over there, but it's, the winters are nice. So a lot of, uh, we get a lot of snowbirds relocating there. Um, it was the fastest growing state as a result between that for, uh, during that first decade of the 21st century. And uh, the La Latinos were the fastest growing ethnic group in Arizona and the country at the time. That has changed to, uh, you know, our economic situation changed a few years ago, as everybody knows. And so uh, the number of uh, the Latinos coming into Arizona and the country dropped, uh, partly because of uh, uh, the economic downturn and partly in Arizona because of uh, SB 1070. A lot of people left uh, Arizona. Not just undocumented people, a, a lot of other good folks uh, who are in that area. Um, it became sort of a hostile environment for people living in, in that state, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one out of three Arizona residents is Latino, according to the 2010 U.S. Census. 90% of those Latinos are of Mexican heritage, so you'll hear people in Arizona say these anti-Latino measures are really anti-Mexican. I think that there's this sentiment in, in Arizona that really the, these measures are anti-Mexican. Um, nationally, 15% of the population is Latino. Uh, the state it, it has an estimated um, 1.9 million Latino residents. 
Oh, a lot of people want to know, well, how many of these people are undocumented? This is a little bit higher figure than the figure I just mentioned uh, earlier from the other, the other uh, organization. But the Pew Hispanic Center was, uh, in 2010, said that there were about 400,000 or 20 percent of the population, the Latino population, um, or 6 percent of the total population was undocumented at the time. Uh, so what is this, this whole situation, the demographic change, the demographic shift, uh, was coupled with a couple of other things mentioned, the economic recession that was going on, uh, and the drug war and violence south of the um, U.S.-Mexico border. And the, the economic recession, I think, is important, especially in the Maricopa County case because that was um, an area that had one of the highest, at this particular time, highest uh, foreclosure rates. And the construction industry was hit, one of, that was one of the industries that was hit the hardest by the um, economic downturn and many of the construction workers um, were let, uh, Latino. So, you know, you have this tenuous, uh, tenuous situation going on. Plus, uh, at the same time, the drug war flares up south of the border, increasing violence, tens of thousands of people dying on the south side of the border. And the threat, there's this threat, you'll hear these people talking about the spillover violence, the threat of spillover violence, which is, um, you know, depending on your perspective, maybe real or, or contrived. The, the evidence so far is the spillover, vi spillover violence has, there really has not been any. I mean, I don't want to overstate that because there have been drug-related, you know, deaths on this side of the border. Uh, but El Paso, San Diego, um, uh, Laredo were, are two, three places um, that are located just north of where a lot of the violence is happening, and they happen to be three of the most safe cities in the country. So, um, you know, there's that. And then the Washington Office on Latin America recently came out and said that spillover violence has not occurred since, uh, you know, this recent flare up of violence over the last three or four years. But it is this, you know, these things are out there, they're in the public discourse, and this helped shape an environment in which. Um, you know, measures like SB 1070 could pass. So just a little bit of background on uh, SB 1070. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. SB stands for Senate bill, by, and that's just the number of the bill, SB 1070. Um, the show me your papers provision, that's the provision that allows law enforcement, actually doesn't allow them, it requires them to uh, check somebody's immigration status if they have the reasonable suspicion that somebody's here um, without documentation to check their status. Um, parts of that, that remains in effect, and so that's sort of being studied by human rights activists, civil rights activists. Uh, other parts of the law were struck down. Uh, for these three provisions, for example, one that requires all immigrants to obtain or carry registration papers, uh, making it a criminal offense or state criminal offense for an undocumented immigrant to seek work or hold a job, and the third, allowing police to arrest suspected undocumented immigrants without warrants, which seems a little contradictory given that they are allowed to do that, um, you know, in the first part, the show me your papers part. But. Um, economic and political fallout since this measure was passed. These are uh, figures from the Center for American Progress, and we'll say, you know, it's a progressive, sort of liberal uh, uh, organization, but this is what they've come up with. You might remember that uh, a congressman from Arizona, Raul Grijalva, after the pas passage of SB 1070, called for a boycott of Arizona. And many other, he wasn't the only one to call for a boycott, but he like, was one of the first. Uh, and so uh, during this boycott, they're saying that $141 million lost in conference cancellations. Um, there was one organization that I'm a part of, the REM class, which is the Rocky Mountain Council on Latin American Studies. And uh, they were scheduled to have their conference there in, I believe it was 2011. 
and they uh, they were supposed to have it in Tucson. They changed it to have it, and they changed the venue to Santa Fe. Uh, and there was this huge debate within the organization whether whether we should have done that or not. Uh, Two hundred fifty-three million dollars in economic output lost. Uh, Nine point four million dollars in tax revenues lost. I guess presumably these are people because people are leaving the state, not contributing the, uh, in terms of sales tax and whatnot, and then a loss of two thousand seven hundred sixty-one jobs. Uh, I think politically Arizona lost a lot in terms of its reputation, became the laughing stock, you know, in many cases around the country and the world. Uh, Clarence Dupnick, sheriff from Pima County, where Tucson is located, said uh, that. Arizona had become a mecca for prejudice and bigotry. Uh, the con it's a little bit of out of context. He made this comment right after um, the shooting of Gabrielle Giffords, um, which in some ways is a reflection really of, of the whole sort of vol volatile nature of the political discourse that was um, very prevalent at the time. Okay, the book. Um, just quickly, we, we've broken it down into four Major parts, uh, the first part is the background, uh, talking about Arizona's strategy to these demographic change and uh, you know, our national security interests. Uh, I do a chapter, two chapters, one on the history and another on the chronology of exclusion in Arizona. And then we have a chapter looking at the economic impact, which shows actually that uh, immigrants contribute more than they uh, take away, you know, there's a net gain financially for the state, which is, you know, a, of concern for people who say we need to do something about the undocumented people who are here because they're sapping social service, et cetera. Uh, Arizona, the second part is con concentrating on the firestorm. By the firestorm, we mean this, it sort of has several meanings. In this case, it's the firestorm of strategy, the strategies that Arizona politicians, mainly the very conservative wing, um, put together during the 2010-2011 period, um, <coughs> SB 1070 being the most famous, the assault on ethnic studies. If you've been following some Arizona politics, you would know that this eth assault on ethnic studies resulted in the ban of a particular Mexican-American studies program in Tucson, uh, the, at Tucson's largest school district. But um, essentially a law was passed that said that um, any ethnic studies programs that sounds outrageous, but any ethnic studies programs that that uh, are designed to promote the overthrow of the government, promote and uh, uh, dissent, um, racial um, d division, um, that these sorts of classes should be, you know, would be in violation of this particular law and there was a lot of studies done about this Mexican American studies program within uh, Tucson Unified School District and the audits found that actually that was not the case. They were not in violation of this law. In fact, uh, anybody was welcome to be in that, that program and they were very successful in retaining um, Latino students in particular who have a you know, high dropout rate. Uh, but the uh, superintendent of public instruction um, uh, John Hoopenthal uh, said, "Well, I don't care about that audit. You know, we spent 100,000 or whatever thousand dollars on that audit. Uh, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. I still think they're in violation of the law. They need to do away with the program, or they're going to forfeit. I think it was 11 million dollars. So the school district was sort of had its hands tied and did away with the program. And now they're in the midst of trying to figure out how to um, maybe rework Me Mexican American studies into the curriculum." or bring it back. Um, Flores versus the state of Arizona is a long-standing lawsuit uh, that goes back to Arizona's inability and failure to deal with um, English learners in the state. So, uh, you know, with a, a population of, uh, you know, one-third Latino and many of them recent immigrants, there are a lot of uh, children who need to um, concentrate on learning English, and uh, the, the state of Arizona has not been able to do it that successfully. So uh, one thing that made them unsuccessful, uh, is, according to this, this chapter in the book, is um, their ban on uh, bilingual education in 2000. 
Uh, so they have now this immersion program where students are supposed to be learning English for four hours a day. They're separated from other students, creates all sorts of uh, you know, social issues, and also is a return to the, the history of um, Arizona having sort of segregated classrooms where Mexicans were put in one classroom. They called them actually Mexican rooms. Um, so it's sort of a return to that. Um, illegal accents, the uh, superintendent of public instruction at the time, Tom Horn, who's now our attorney general, uh, thought that it'd be a good idea to go in 2011 and go through all the classrooms to find out sort of the level of proficiency of English of all the teachers uh, through in K-12. And so they went through and he had a whole team going through all of the, the um, I know it sounds outrageous, doesn't it, in 21st century, but... Uh, yeah, they went through um, to the classrooms and they found out that you know some people had accents and thought that, that maybe that they shouldn't be teaching English because they have accents. So there's a chapter on that in the book um, and why um, sort of the raci racialization of language and how that, that uh, has happened. And then the other chapter is the assault on the 14th Amendment. A lot of people know that as a birthright citizenship amendment. Um, we actually have Alberto Gonzalez, the former state, uh, the former uh, attorney general, U.S. attorney general under George Bush, um, wrote uh, a chapter on why it's not a good idea to do away with birthright citizenship. Um, you know, of course, we're not the only country that uh, is dealing with immigration, and um, but for example, in Germany, they they're dealing with this issue of. Uh, uh, of immigration and having, um, you know, it's, it's been a controversial topic there. They do not have birthright citizenship. And if you've talked to some folks there, uh, it's created a whole, you know, underclass of people because they don't have birthright citizenship for people who uh, are not citizens when they're born there. And um, I'm not an expert in that, but it just to sort of get back to the theme here of immigration being a global phenomenon. Uh, meet mass media roles, as I mentioned, we, we look at those three areas, English language media, Spanish language media, and Mexican media. And then the fourth part is our global vertigo and our inability to look at immigration from a really global perspective. I think what helps uh, people who really see it from a national viewpoint, I mean, is when you liken it to other phenomenon like climate change, then it sort of creates this light bulb like, oh yeah, we can't really solve climate change because that's a, you know, a global process. Well, immigration or migration is a global process and has to be dealt with globally is one of our fundamental arguments. Um, the conceptual framework that we're using in this is one called moral geography. Moral geography, um, you know, I've got a working definition up there, a contested space where ethical choices are made about a particular people and place, and there's also an internal logic that belongs to a particular people and place. Uh, anthropologists have used this. Um, I think it's also useful when we think about the media and how the media can contr contribute to our um, definitions or sense uh, of a place. So, you know, you see here, uh, these different ways of representing a place. These are uh, people who are protesting against uh, SB 1070 before the governor passed it. That's from a march, I believe, in, in Phoenix. This is the U.S.-Mexico border on the south side, um, uh, on the uh, Sonoran side of the border, where they've put up some artwork um, and they, that they don't let that happen on the U.S. side. I guess they want it to be controlled by all the um, different instruments that they use to make sure that people are not coming across. Um, and question, yes, please. Um, um, you might not be able to answer this in the short span here, but what exactly does geography mean here? Geography. Well, I mean, I think it's more the way I'm using it yeah. is a more inclusive. Um, I, it, it's a a space, a physical space, but it's about our, the way we intellectualize it, the way we conceptualize that space, and who is allowed to live there, who's not, how, who gets to uh, make decisions about a particular place, um, and that there's, this, I mean, very bluntly put, there's a good and bad way to do that. Um, 
so I think it's useful in, in, for this discussion, especially in the US-Mexico borderlands, which is a, a contested space. Um, and so you have various stakeholders, like the Border Patrol, Minutemen, who are sort of vigilante group that want to patrol the border because they don't feel that the Border Patrol is being effective. You have immigration or human rights activists who have another you know, perception and, and, and notion about what the border should be. Um, and, and all of this is, is, is informed by the power relations that exist. So the moral geography of one place would be different from another, right? The moral geography for Arizona, Sonora is going to be different than, than here in North Carolina. Is, so is what, what would be those factors? Would it be purely based on the power relations or the power structure, or what would be some of the elements which would characterize that, contributing to the differences? Well, the way we look at it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not systematized in that particular way, but it's, it's more of a, um, how, different, how, how different groups are representing the identity of a place, if I put it, put it in those terms. We have that idea of political geography. So in the moment that we think of geography, we think on a physical thing, right? On a territory attached to a, to a nation state. But you always talk about social geography. You can think about it, no? A cultural geography. A cultural geography. It's similar. Yeah, I think it's more connected to. Mm -hmm. So some of the main arguments here uh, in the book and that I'd like to make today are that uh, local strategy is just not going to address a global issue. They're going to be ineffective. Uh, so even the uh, plan, the uh, immigration reform plan that was uh, unveiled a week and a half ago, uh, it's got a limited, eff limited effectiveness. Um, the media, uh, if you look through history, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, have been complicit in creating an environment that it was favorable to SB 1070, uh, FSB 1070 and measures like them. Uh, and by and large, they reaffirm the dominant moral geography that is in place. Uh, Arizona's dominant moral geography is determined by power relations, as I was just kind of explaining. And then the other point I want to make is that I hear a lot among uh, scholars and others the Arizona, um, you know, is this place where, and then that had this measure and SB 1070, and it was copycatted <coughs> in other places. And that these uh, processes are just, um, you know, being repeated in other places. Well, I think there is something distinct historically and contemporarily that makes Arizona different, and I'll kind of explain that. So the history and the media, for you, some of you probably, a lot of you may know already that, um, you know, Arizona was part of Mexico not too long ago. And uh, this part here, you see the squiggly line there above Tucson? That's known as the Gila River. And that, then you see the dotted line around there. That whole area, um, was, is mainly the uh, area of the Gadsden Purchase, which is in 1853. And so uh, that's when Arizona, um, that, that part of Arizona becomes, which was in those days the New Mexico Territory, becomes part of the United States. So it hasn't really been all that long. What's interesting to me in terms of this geography is that whole area is now considered uh, by some activists and, and some liberal sort of politicians as, as current Baja, Arizona. So um, you see that north of the Gila River is more prosperous also and less Latino. Um, so you see that uh, how that ends up shaping the, poli the politics locally in a lot of ways. Um, I talked about the Moral geography being uh, 
is reflected in who, who ends up staying and who ends up going or who's allowed to stay or who's allowed to, to go. Um, we've seen this sort of, uh, throughout the 20th century, there have been several occasions in which um, the Anglo hegemony in uh, Arizona thought that maybe, maybe um, may primarily Mexican immigrants, some of the Me Mexican um, Americans born U.S. citizens uh, should be sent back. This was like during the uh, Great Depression, so they were seen as, as threats to um, other people being able to get jobs, and this is a photograph of, of hundreds of people who were being sent back to, to Mexico from Miami. It's pro pronounced Miami over there. Uh, Miami, Arizona, which is a mining community. And uh, many Mexicans, um, uh, born in Mexico, Mexican nationals and Mexican Americans worked in the mining industry and continue to, to this day. But during that particular time, they thought it was, uh, they were uh, competing too much with US jobs, so they sent them back, as many as, uh, according to some estimates, a million, a million people. Uh, so what's the media's relationship? Talking a little bit more about the media's relationship to this idea of moral geography, uh, it was actually a, a journalist, John L. O. Sullivan, who coined this term manifest destiny, right? Uh, he wasn't the first person to, to, to talk about the United States are moving west, but he was the one to coin the term. Uh, he used it in um, 18, the sort of uh, idea about the United States destined, many nations, is destined to manifest to mankind the excellence of divine principles to establish on earth the noblest temple ever dedicated to the worship of the Most High, the Sacred, and the True. That was in the United States and Democratic Review in 1839. And then in 1845, he actually used the term manifest destiny. Uh, to uh, when he was talking about the uh, sort of his support for the annexation of Texas, claiming that, quote, the fulfillment of our manifest destiny is to overspread the continent allotted by the providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions in the Democratic Review there. Um, there's been some work done on newspapers of the West. Barbara Cloud, historian, media historian, looks at the importance of newspapers um, in, in the West. Um, and she talks a little bit about Arizona. And she said that in Arizona, they actually maybe had a greater uh, importance because of the importance of mining. And many of these mining um, interests owned newspapers at the time. So they helped to. Um, you know, become boosters for, for Anglo development. Um, in the 1900s, you know, getting to how, how Mexicans were portrayed during that time, they were often portrayed in these newspapers as, um, um, in, in terms of labor movements, they were, they were portrayed as bandits, often um, who were, at, you know, easy to, um, you know, get involved in, in problems, easily swayed by agitators who had the potential for carrying out a race war. Um, and granted, if you know a little bit about the history of mining, there were different pay scales. So Mexican workers got paid much less than Anglo workers. Chinese workers got paid less than um, um, Mexican workers. So there was this whole hierarchy. And Mexican workers were uh, not allowed to live in certain parts of the, of the town. So. You know, there was some real racial tension going on there. They might have actually had a reason to uh, carry out a, uh, you know, somewhat of a struggle there. Um, in 1954, this is a term that the Border Patrol used, Operation Wetback. Again, another period in which uh, Mexican workers were uh, determined, you know, was determined that they should not be in this country because they, it was a time of economic downturn. Maybe they should be sent home. And so the Border Patrol devised this plan called the Operation went back to deport uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And the newspapers played a role in all of this because they would, um, we, we would, to this day, you know, today we would think, oh, that's horrible. How could they even use um, the term went back um, to refer to uh, undocumented people, you know, and um, 
So they, but they did. They used that term without much, um, you know, critique, and they didn't put it in quotes or anything like that. Um, and it was just very matter of fact. And they often used the war-like terms, so terms like invasion, um, uh, invasion, threat. These these kinds of terms to refer re refer to the people that needed to be deported. Um, I just find it interesting that those terms were used when you know the United States and Mexico was they were not at war at that time um, and then I've done a little bit of research on the 1970s and looking um, at local television and what I've found is that by and large through the types of coverage uh, limited first of all there's a limited amount of coverage of, of Latinos to begin with and then the, the when they are included in the news it's usually um, especially in this particular time it's a um, a story that re relates to crime or illegal immigration. And then these terms um, such as they are coming in droves, it's a silent invasion and flood, all work to sort of dehumanize a population over time, which had already been, you know, a long process um, from the century before. Um, so this is just an image that, uh, one of the images that I looked at, is uh, a young man unid unidentified in um, the back of a Border Patrol van. This is just a snapshot of, of a film clip um, during uh, the 1970s. And I used this because this person's image um, in this particular film clip was used throughout uh, an entire decade for as file video, you know, you see that sometimes. They'll use just file video of the border when they're talking about immigration, you know. Um, and this person's f uh, video image face was used in many stories throughout an entire decade and never identified. So what this ends up doing uh, is, I warn my students about this because, you know, you could do it in a lot of different contexts. When you use file video, this is the danger in using file video and not identifying somebody is you create a sense that, you know, a whole group, one person stands for a whole group, and this person doesn't have an identity, is therefore, <coughs> you know, some, and some level dehumanized. Uh, so that was, that happened a, a quite a f few times. I mean, and, it, and I kind of wondered, I mean, who is this person? He might not even, number one, he might be a citizen by now, or number two, he might not even be in the country, and we're continuing to see his image. Um, and then just sort of fast forwarding the, um, the tension between the border and undocumented immigrants, uh, you know, increases dramatically after 9-11. So it's all about, I mean, they actually closed down the border uh, right after 9-11. And so the border is seen as increasingly as a danger zone, which leads to, in some cases in the media, undocumented people being portrayed uh, as criminals and then also in the discourse. We heard our governor talking about uh, most of the people coming across were coming across to commit crimes, um, all kinds of, of things like that. And um, the statistics actually show it's the opposite. Most, um, undoc the undocumented population as a whole has a, um, their cr level crime rate is much lower than the general population. Um, this is more for effect. I don't expect anybody to read and all of this. It's more of an, um, just to show that there has been a, a whole chronology of exclusion that dates back to uh, the early part of the century when numerous Jim Crow laws were passed. For example, Anglo-Americans who were not supposed to marry uh, African-Americans, Asians, Native Americans. Um, there was educational segregation between whites, Mexicans, and Native Americans and African Americans. Um, they were restricted from j certain job opportunities. Um, one interesting example I found was um, in the, I think it was in the 40s, 50s, uh, what was it back then, Ma Bell? Pacific, Pac wasn't Pac Bell, it was, well, AT and, what is AT&T is now. Um, they, of course, had operators, probably some people might remember the operators uh, that we used to talk to. Well, they would not, if somebody had a Spanish surname in Arizona, they would not even interview the person to be an operator because it was just assumed that that person 
had an accent, it would not be a good fit you know, for uh, being an operator. So that kind of thing would go on. Of course, the, um, great, great, during the Great Depression, talked about the um, practice of deportation, uh, the de facto segregation of Mexican students in Arizona, the Mexican rooms that I, that I talked about. Um, this one particular, I've put in red the, the parts that are actually chapters in, in the book. So that's just a little detail on the um, Flores case. So that actually goes back to 1992 and we're still, um, still trying to figure out you know, how to deal with the um, English learners in the state in an effective way. Uh, let's see, which ones could I highlight here? Um, I think what's important here is the 1996 um, ruling, Supreme Court ruling that sh said that Im in terms of uh, immigration enforcement that, that um, ethnic factors could be used or be considered in terms of determining somebody's uh, status. Uh, and then if you think about the border, this a couple years before um, Operation Safeguard began. And what happened during that time, the mid 90s, um, Tijuana and or, or San Isidro and El Paso Juarez were like the big uh, places, they were the most popular places for people to, to cross um, without papers. So uh, well, they needed to do something about it, they being the Border Patrol, so what they did was they, they, they started Operation, um, Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego and then Operation Hold the Line in Texas. And it really ended up creating this deadly tunnel or funnel uh, to Arizona. And they put in Operation Safeguard in, in Arizona, but still people uh, kept coming to, to Arizona. Uh, because it's very, you know, it's just very sparsely populated. It, they have not been able to, um, it's a very porous border, so it's, it's difficult to, to, you know, stop everybody from, from coming. And so that, the big thing about the, that change within the Border Patrol enforcement is instead of, um, previously it was a, um, it was a enforcement that was based on apprehension. Um, so once they crossed, then they would be apprehended. This new way of, of securing the border was uh, supposed to be a, um, a strategy of deterrence. So that's why you see the increased militarization of the border, because it's intended to deter people, but it, in some cases it hasn't. Um, 2000, uh, that's when we banned uh, bilingual education. Um, and then uh, this is um, Proposition 300, which made uh, students who could not prove that they had legal residency made them ineligible for state um, tuition, in-state tuition. And you being a, is this a land-grant institution? It's a public university. So, you know, the in-state tuition is much less than for people who are coming out of state. So it makes, in its essence, it makes, um, you know, a college education uh, un, un, um, unavailable for many people who can't afford it. So just quickly, these are some of the measures that were passed in uh, 2010, some that I've already gone over. Um, then 2011, they tried to alter the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, that failed. They also tried to pass, um, this is in 2011, also tried to pass even a more draconian um, anti-immigrant legislation, which, which failed because the business industry by that time said, you know what, enough is enough. This is affecting our economy, our reputation. People don't want to come here. You know, let's put a hold on it. So 2012 was actually somewhat um, free of, of these kinds of uh, measures. But I'll talk about 2013 in a second. It was just a, maybe a short blip. Um, media roles, just in a, in a nutshell, what we found in the U.S. news media in SB 1070 is um, actually the news media, we're talking about 
um, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, tended to be portray SB 1070 and immigrants um, in either a neutral or a positive, positive way. So w what I mean by positive is that they were um, against SB 1070. Um, and neutral meaning that they just didn't side one way or the other. Um, with Spanish language news media, what you found, if, if you know anything about Spanish language media, um, a lot of the people who were producing reports took on an advocacy role. So it was very much uh, in favor, their, their uh, coverage was in favor of some of the mobilization, some of the protests that, that uh, were organized after um, SB 1070 passed. And this was in, in broadcast news in, in Univision and Telemundo in Los Angeles and other parts of the country, not just, not just the Phoenix area. Um, so they really did see this as um, the people who did this chapters did some interviews with um, executives from Univision and Telemundo and some of the executives really did see this as sort of the Latino civil rights movement and uh, felt that it was very important for them to be there to, to support um, the Latino uh, community and um, by and large their viewers. Um, with respect to news media in Mexico, it's very interesting because often in U.S. coverage, we'll see um, undocumented immigrants portrayed either as victims, um, usually as victims or opportunities, right? The, the, the immigrant is either victimized or is an opportunity for economic growth. Um, that's sort of like the, the two ways uh, the U.S. media in general portray Im immigrants. Um, in Mexico, they find something somewhat si similar. Um, and this is reporting on Mexican immigrants who uh, come to the United States primarily. So they uh, are, they found in this chapter that uh, undocumented immigrants are, are either portrayed um, often as heroes as heroes that could overcome the challenges of the struggle of crossing the border and being successful in the United States, or as victims, victims of border bandits, of, of the system in the United States. Um, so you, know, you, you get these dichotomies, which in terms of informing a public um, is not necessarily a good thing when you want them to see beyond just the very you know, surface sort of ideas. Okay, so here we are in 2013. We had the Senate immigration uh, plan unveiled last a week and a half ago. Uh, Obama's plan was uh, unveiled, was it the very next day? If not the very next day, a couple days after. Um, and so it seems like there's momentum to try to get something done. The realities of the election, I think, hit some of the Republicans pretty hard, as we saw in that, that clip uh, at the beginning. Uh, whether you know, something actually gets done and what that is going to end up looking like is going to be, uh, you know, I think, remains to be seen, especially when you're tying, uh, if you read a little bit about this, what they, the, the Republican or the, um, well, it's bipartisan, really. Although I think it is interesting that they have um, McCain from Arizona and Jeff Flake from Arizona, both uh, among the eight people who are in this bipartisan, um, this bipartisan group. Um, what they are trying to do with this uh, Senate plan is tie citizenship to the security of the border. So they're saying nobody can become a citizen until the border is secured. Well, I mean, if you look at some of the data, the border has actually not, never been so secure. I mean, we've got so much, if you, I would invite anybody here to, if you've not been down there to come visit me, I'll be happy to take you there. And, um, you know, just as a quick anecdote, I went running, uh, you know, I don't run that much, but I try to run a little bit. Um, and uh, I got, was probably, I don't know, maybe less than a mile from the border. So we were actually having a, this academic retreat at a, at a, a guest ranch along the border. 
And so I went for a morning run and I was stopped twice by um, Homeland Security and Border Patrol. Very friendly, wanted to look at the bottom of my shoes. Um, actually one picked up a, a little the camera case that I had dropped and asked me if this was mine. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Have a nice day. And um, it, so it is a militarized zone for all intents and purposes. Um, so to pin citizenship to border security, I think, is somewhat problematic. I mean, immigration is a, a process in and of itself. Uh, some would argue that border security is, so needs to be disengaged from that. Um, and I would argue that. Um, so that, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, it's the carrot, right? It's the carrot that the, you offer the Republicans to. Uh, in order for something like comprehensive immigration reform to pass, you need to give them uh, something. And, um, but that something, I think, is so hard to, to determine. How do you determine what is secure? Um, and then we have Arizona still doing its thing. Uh, hasn't given up. Our governor hasn't given up, and she might even run for a re I will say not re-election because she was never actually elected. She was appointed after our Democratic governor Janet Napolitano is uh, came uh, to be the uh, Homeland Security, um, the head of Homeland Security. So that's uh, the fallout from that is is we're dealing with that in Arizona. So uh, this legislative session already we see. Um, Senator, or I'm sorry, um, Representative Smith uh, has introduced these two pieces of legislation, HB House Bill 2293 would require hospital staff to check the immigration status of patients without insurance. Uh, creates a really oh, a difficult, if not um, just very challenging circumstance for healthcare workers, for one, and then would possibly, in many cases, <coughs> prevent people from even going to seek medical attention. Uh, HB, if that were to pass, I'm not sure what the political will is at this point. Uh, it's Republican dominated, but we'll see how, how willing they are to kind of push this anti-immigrant, these measures. Uh, HB 2289 would require schools to keep track of all undocumented students. So the big thing is we want to know how much uh, it's costing the state to educate people who aren't here legally. And the person who's behind this measure said, oh, we don't want you to report. We don't want you to report. We just want you to keep track because we want to, we want to know how much it's costing the state. Yeah, it sounds like, okay, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, why not? Find out how much this is really, you know, we all kind of want to know what's going on. Um, but in a but in essence, what that would do is create, you know, fear among people. I mean, it's been decided by the Supreme Court that people who are here, even undocumented, have the right to education. This has been a Supreme Court ruling. Um, so, but this would create a, you know, sense of fear among the immigrant community, and many uh, people would would probably not be sending their children to school. Which, of course, you know, as educators and people who are trying to get an education, we know how important that is and what kind of deleterious maybe effects that could have in the long term. Um, so in conclusion, I think uh, Arizona is different. I hope I've kind of helped you to see how maybe it is different than other parts of the country where immigration is de being debated, um, partly as a result of this economic recession, which I think hit Arizona more deeply than in other parts of the country, and particularly in this region where there was a large uh, increase in, in Latino, Latinos um, and where the construction industry was really hit hard. Um, it has a history of these exclusionary measures, which I've gone over. The demographic change was, was uh, very much in, in the process in 2010. And then it has this, uh, getting back to the idea of, of uh, how we understand the geography, we are so close to the border that you know, it's constantly in the papers, it's constantly in the news. Um, so maybe you know, we, we have a heightened sense of, of awareness and concern about the border and what that means in terms of real threat or perceived threat of violence there. Uh, and then the, uh, the other conclusion I would just mention that you know, it, we do have this uh, anti-immigrant sentiment and nativism that, that we have today you know, has um, some historical antecedents. So I'm going to leave it there. Maybe we can talk about 
um, prospects for the future, whatever. I'd like to entertain your questions, comments, doubts, tomatoes. <laughs>